The President departs the island to engage in two official overseas tours as the newly gazetted high security zones continue to divide opinion. Good evening and welcome. This is Prime Time News on TV1. For the News First team, I'm Jaima Ratnayaka. Today is the 26th of September 2022. Here are your headlines for tonight. Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka opposes the use of the official secret act to declare high security zones. Janadi Patituma, Perla Ratata Pemini Pasu, Metatwe Nevata, Samalo Chene Kerala, Etuma, Tindua Ganoeti, Kela, Api Viswas Kerno. Six hour prior approval is necessary for protests and demonstrations, says Defense Ministry. IUSF's Abbasanta Mudalige questioned over speeches. Gold face Aragale Abbasan. President of the Japan on official visit appoints five acting ministers. Supreme Court says President Vikramasinghe cannot be named as a respondent in the Easter attacks case. Wrong crude oil imports put refinery in limbo. Coastal train travel between Panadura and Fort reduced to 20 kilometers per hour. In our top story for tonight, a Sri Lankan police officer has been hailed a hero after he valiantly stopped two men from making a getaway with a loot of over 20 million rupees today. A local businessman reached a private bank in Tambuthegama in his car to deposit over 20 million rupees. CCTV footage obtained by News First showed how two men on a motorcycle tried to grab the money as the businessman was attempting to exit the vehicle. However, the robbers could not grab the bag in one go because the businessman held on to it resulting in some money falling on the road. According to eyewitnesses, a police officer who was passing by heard the commotion and questioned the two men regarding the handling of the money. However, a woman had informed the police officer that the money did not belong to the men. The police officer immediately sprung into action and his heroics are hailed by all. The two men who attempted to make a getaway on the motorcycle did not manage to get far. Sri Lanka police said that the suspects are residents from Thambu Tegama and one of them was reportedly working as a security officer at the private bank. A 12-bow shotgun, gloves, a sharp weapon, mobile phones and a motorcycle were seized by the police from the possession of the suspects. Sri Lanka police said that the men had attempted to steal over 20 million rupees and make a getaway. In more headline news, the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka says the Official Secrets Act cannot be used to declare high security zones. Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka says that the notion that the high security zones be declared under the Official Secret Act is a fallacy without any justification or basis. The Human Rights Commission says it is deeply concerned about the government's approach to adopting the Official Secret Act and making a declaration which grossly violates the fundamental rights of the people of this country. And it reiterates that the Official Secret Act cannot be adopted to declare high security zones. HRCSL further advises the government to direct the withdrawal of the Gazette bearing number to 298 forward slash 53 dated 23rd September and to take measures to ensure that national laws are following the accepted international and national human rights norms and standards and to preclude declarations that violate those norms and standards. The acting defense minister told reporters today the president would review the position on high security zones and make an appropriate decision. High security zones are nothing new to Sri Lanka and it is common in many countries. 
countries. The people can continue to move in and about the high security zone and it will only be an issue for those engaged in unlawful conduct. After the president returns, he will review the situation in the country and would decide on whether or not to continue with high security zones. The Socialist Youth Union filed a fundamental rights petition at the Supreme Court demanding the government to abolish the Gazette declared to classify high security zones using the Official Secret Act. Sri Lanka's Acting Minister of Defence, Premita Bandara Tenukon, has stressed that approval must be sought six hours prior to engage in a protest or demonstration. The Sri Lankan police can be informed about any protest or demonstration six hours prior to the commencement. There will be no issue when permission is obtained in the said manner. No party will be given permission under any circumstances to act in an irresponsible manner that violates the laws for public peace in the country. The government will act responsibly on the matter. If not, the previous state of anarchy will emerge in the country once again. We cannot allow such a situation to take place in the country once again. We no longer witness the gas and fuel queues that caused inconveniences to the public. Public transportation, education and other activities are going on as usual. In addition, we have been able to deliver the much needed fertilizer to the farming community. The government is taking the necessary measures to provide stability and sustainable solutions to the people. No one can deny that it is the truth. Certain trade unions and political groups are attempting to cause anarchy to achieve their political goals. We are also witnessing a race among political parties on who gathers the most media coverage on protests. These protests are not from the grassroots or the villagers. They are organized by the aforementioned groups from Colombo-based areas. The government cannot allow a dangerous situation to prevail in the country. Sri Lanka police is fully engaged and if necessary the armed forces are ready to assist. There is no issue in protesting and demonstrating. They need to have a prior approval and must comply with the law. This is a law that existed for decades and will be carried forward. The police will listen to the requests being made and will take the necessary action. We have understood that the agitation site was declared in the wrong place. Many accommodation sites used by foreign envoys are located in this particular area as well. Given its position, it's not possible to carry out the functions of the President's office, the Secretariat and other places. You should have witnessed how the protests from the agitation site reached the doorstep of the President's office. Then the operations cannot continue. महाजन नियोजित इंगे निवेश वर्ग का पहाड़ दिन संबंध है। महेंद्र निश्चय कारो राजकारी नौकरी में संबंध है। वर्तमान पुलिस पति सीडी विक्रम रत्नम ऐतमा साह हिटपुर हमदा पति सावेंद्र सिल्लाटा चौदना एल्लोना। ये वाली चौदना एल्लोना तमाई। Yes, allegations were made and the former president appointed a committee led by Admiral of the Fleet Vasant Karan Nagoda that also includes Marshal of the Air Force Roshan Gunatilaka and former Army Commander Daya Ratnayaka. The secretary of the committee was Jeevanti Senanayaka. The committee investigated the matter and submitted a report to the president. We are not aware of the recommendations and we must await the report to be made available. Tactics, dusting tactics, Dusting old laws that don't provide remedy for these situations and try to uh, prevent people from exercising their freedom of expression, namely to come out and uh, protest about the government's actions. The only way out of this is to have a parliamentary election very soon. Sri Lanka Bodhijana Paramuna does not have a parliamentary uh, mandate from the people but they continue to retain a parliamentary majority therefore the parliament must be dissolved and general elections held and after that the incumbent president also must resign and the new parliament with people's mandate will then be able to elect a president this must happen immediately if not both the president and the parliament which don't have the people's 
mandate will resort to such diabolical acts in order to hang on to power. The Socialist Youth Union filed a fundamental rights application with the Supreme Court today over the attack on the protest that took place on Saturday. I was involved in the march. You can see how I was struck near the eye with a police baton. The march was dispersed and 84 people were arrested. Today, 84 petitions were filed. Our request is to immediately abolish the Gazette that was issued as it is being used to suppress peaceful dissent. The Inter-University Students' Federation of the Peheradhen University staged a protest demanding the government to end suppression. Engineering students marched up to the Galaha Junction in protest. Pranil Vikramasinghe, who boasted saying he can solve this economic crisis with his international connections, has now successfully worsened the situation. The government is now trying to suppress the people who are rising against them. The Students' Federation of the Kalane University stayed to protest opposite the university premises. <laughs> A group of lawyers travelled to the Terrorism Investigation Central Camp in Tangol today and inquired into the well-being of the convener of the Inter-University Students Federation, Vasanta Mudalige, and student activist Hashan Jeevanta, who are currently detained at the location. They have questioned Vasanta Mudalige regarding the 21 speeches he made since April this year till the end of the golf face Aragalaya. They are interrogating him regarding the statements he made during these speeches. Take legal action if he has committed any wrongdoings against the government. They have already pressed charges and presented hundreds of Aragalaya activists in court. Why is it one law for those activists and a different one for Vasanta Mudalige? The father of student activist Hashan Jeevanta also visited the Terrorism Investigation Central Camp earlier. Today. A signature campaign that commenced from Jaffna demanding to immediately repeal the PTA took place in the Kandy and Nuralia districts. An initiative of this program was carried out at the Rikil Lagaskada town, headed by parliamentarian Shani Ken Razamanikam, Sri Lanka Podujana Perumana parliamentarian Jeevan Tondaman, and a number of representatives from several other parties were also present. They are not using the PTA to stop terrorism. They are using the PTA to suppress anyone who has an opposing political opinion. That is clear. They have demarcated the Colombo district as a high security zone. They'll have to make the entire country a high security zone once the people take to the streets. Signatures were obtained at the Akurana town as well, demanding the government to repeal the Prevention of Terrorism Act. In another headline making story, President Ranil Vikramasinghe took wing this morning for official tours in Japan and the Philippines. The President is expected to attend the funeral of former Prime Minister of Japan Shinzo Abe during his tour. He is also scheduled to hold bilateral discussions with Japan's Prime Minister, Foreign Minister and Minister of Finance. President Vikramasinghe, who will fly to the Philippines on the 28th, is set to attend the Asian Development Bank's Board of Governors meeting, which he will be heading for the next two years. The President is also scheduled to meet with his counterpart from the Philippines, Bongbong Marcos, and President of the Asian Development Bank, Matsugu Asakawa, during his visit. The the President's media division says President Vikramasinghe will return to the island on the 30th of September. Meanwhile, the President has appointed five state ministers of the SLPP to oversee five ministries under his purview for the duration he is overseas. SLPP parliamentarian Pramita Bandara Tenakon has been appointed the Acting Minister of Defence, while SLPP lawmaker Shehan Sema Singha has been named the Acting Minister of Finance, Economic Stabilisation and National Policies. SLPP MP Anupa Pasquale has been appointed the Acting Minister 
Minister of Women, Child Affairs and Social Empowerment. State Minister Dilu Mamunugam of the SLPP has been named the Acting Minister of Investment Promotion, while SLPP State Minister Kanaka Herat has been appointed the Acting Minister of Technology. The seven-member bench of the Supreme Court unanimously decided that the petitions against President Ranil Vikramasinghe, who has been named as a respondent in the fundamental rights petitions filed in relation to the Easter attacks, cannot be continued. The fundamental rights petitions were called before a seven-member bench headed by Chief Justice Jayanta Jayasurya. The justices of the Supreme Court reached a decision following submissions made by Senior Additional Solicitor General, President's Counsel Priyanta Navana, who noted that the case cannot be taken forward by naming the President as a respondent, given that he is awarded immunity as per Article 35.1 of the Constitution. How long will tomorrow's scheduled power outages be? We have the details after the short commercial break. News first. Main sponsor. Anko eke arakshita iti gini petti. Surya gini petti. Sapura Galen may Satu the Surakshitakarani, Islam Insight, Islam Jeeva Jale Jeevite Lobatama Elia then Gilena Surya Amataka Vinnemanatina Maki Surya Ohotin Dalvena Gini Kura Surya Kawadat Namagat Gini Petti Surya Kavadat namagat gini petti surya Kavadat kotanat samage vishwase dinagat Anko ege arakshita iti gini petti Surya gini petti Welcome back, you're watching Primetime News on TV1. Sri Lanka will experience power outages of 2 hours and 20 minutes on Tuesday the 27th and Wednesday the 28th of September as the country is likely to face a power generation crisis once more. A statement published on the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka website noted that in the event CEB is compelled to take demand management measures due to inadequate generation as a result of fuel shortages, power cuts will have to be imposed. However, Power and Energy Minister Kanchana Vijay Sekhar tweeted on Monday that furnace oil and diesel will be made available by Ceylon Petroleum Corporation for power generation on the requirements of the Ceylon Electricity Board. The Ceylon Electricity Board says that furnace oil and diesel fuel is used at a minimum to reduce the cost of power generation by CEB. A letter dated the 22nd of September 2022 from the CEB to the PUCSL reveals the gravity of the power crisis that Sri Lanka is likely to face. It noted that the usable fuel stocks at the West Coast power plant is only sufficient for two days of full load plant operations. It also noted that diesel stocks at the Kalanithisa power plant have been fully exhausted. The CEB said that all available hydro power plants are substantially dispatched under the thermal power plant restrictions. The Ceylon Electricity Board had told the Public Utilities Commission that the available coal stocks are sufficient only up to the end of October 2022 and the availability of the next fuel shipment is still uncertain. Given the situation on power generation, on the 15th of September 2022, the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation had hiked the price of a litre of furnace soil delivered to the CEB by 65 rupees. According to trade unions, the cost of furnace oil production has spiked as crude oil that does not meet the requirements of the Sapugaskanda refinery was imported. Ural's crude oil is not suitable to be used in the refinery because it has a high viscosity grade and contains high sulfur. In order to reduce the sulfur levels, we will have to mix it with super diesel, which is a very valuable product produced by our plant. In addition, kerosene will have to be mixed as well to maintain the sulfur levels. That will bring the sulfur level to around 
0.7 and some private companies have started to reject the products. The situation is such that the common man will not be able to access kerosene. <laughs> Two shipments of crude oil that is not suitable for refining was imported. We managed to somewhat produce fuel by mixing the Merban crude oil. We are now operating only with the Urals crude oil which contains high sulfur. Despite our concerns, they imported a third shipment of the same product. We have cut down on production because crude is purchased at 65 US dollars and unloaded at over 100 US dollars. There is no response over LP gas production. The sulfur rate of this crude is very high. In the meantime, the Public Utilities Commission has sent a letter to the CPC and informed that the costs incurred due to unnecessary expenses of the corporation cannot be allowed to be included in the electricity rates. The Public Utilities Commission is of the opinion that the CPC is able to supply crude at the price of 320 rupees for electricity generation given that crude oil prices did not increase in the world market. Due to the financial crisis, the purchase of sufficient fuel is also in a crisis. Meanwhile, as a result of importing inferior crude oil, there is an additional cost in providing fuel for electricity. Will the people have to carry this burden on their laurels as well, given that the country is already facing financial constraints? Lengthy queues opposite filling stations situated across the island were a common sight several months ago, accentuating the extent of the fuel crisis that gripped Sri Lanka. The government thereafter took measures to counter this situation by introducing a QR code based system to ease demand and ensure a fair supply of fuel. Has the fuel allocation system served its intended purpose? News First's Ruhaza Irfan files this report. The Sri Lankan public for months had to face a shortage of fuel, leaving them with no option but to wait in fuel queues for hours to pump their tanks. Much to their satisfaction, the fuel queue have reduced by now with the use of the QR code system introduced by the government. However, the exorbitant price of fuel remains the problem to many. We opted to ask the general public on what they think about the weekly quota of fuel that they purchase under the QR code system. Common scenes that Sri Lankans witnessed throughout the past months were endless fuel queues. However, that's not the scene today. As you can see behind me, a fuel queue has reduced as it was never before. People and motorists say they wish that they could go back in time where they can purchase fuel for a reasonable price in any quantity they desire. For the News First team, I am Ruha Zerfan. Sri Lanka Railways has decided to reduce the speed of trains operating along the western coast. News First's Senator Sena Nayaka delves deeper into the reasons behind this development. Sri Lanka Railway said that the speed of the trains operating between Colombo Fort and Vadua will be limited to 20 km per hour from today due to the renovations on the coastal railway route. These trains are delayed by 15 minutes every day. The main reason is weakness of the tracks on the coastal belt. We have imposed a speed limit of 20 km per hour between Colombo and Vadua. The original speed was 60 km per hour. Therefore, when we reduce the speed, we cannot avoid a delay. This will affect all the trains. We have decided to change the train timetable as well. As a result of the recent increase in transport costs, many taxpaying citizens like you and I are using trains to commute often these days. However, many passengers who use trains have one concern in their minds these days, and that is the dilapidated conditions of Sri Lankan railway tracks. I am right next to the Kolpiti train station. And as you can see, the tracks leading up to the Kolpiti train station are completely covered with rust. As you can see, the steel rail and the fish bolt connecting the sleeper to the steel rail are completely covered with rust. Now the question is this, who is responsible for any accident that takes place due to the poor conditions of these tracks. 
with Nandana Vimala Sena, I'm Senator Sena Nayaka reporting for News First. In more local news, Sri Lanka's food industry is currently in peril. How severely will the chicken and egg crisis in the country worsen it? News First's Nisal Suryarachi filed this report. The Sri Lankan food industry is predominantly dependent on the poultry industry. Chicken and egg prices have skyrocketed in the recent past, making it almost impossible for the average Sri Lankan family to afford them. Kids in most rural areas are malnourished as their parents are unable to afford the food they need. This is an issue that affects every single household in Sri Lanka. What is the reason for the chicken and egg crisis that's crippling the Sri Lankan food industry? There have been massive limitations to sourcing materials to manufacture bird food that is given at poultry farms limiting the supply of bird food in the market and therefore inflating the prices in the market making chicken and eggs more expensive than it has to be I'm reporting to you from the Narayanpit Economic Center and we are here to check the prices on eggs and chicken here today. And the prices are extremely high compared to this time last year. And the merchants here are saying that despite the prices are going up, the profits have decreased as there are less margins and there is less production because the, the manufacturing cost has increased. People are unable to come and purchase these products because prices are sky high. With the people as always, I'm Nisal Suryaraj reporting for News First. Protests took place today against suppression and the rising cost of living. Students from the Rajrat University protested against suppression. They protested for around an hour and later dispersed. Meanwhile, locals protested near the Candy Clock Tower against the rising cost of living. What is Sri Lanka's bilateral debt as at June 2022? A recent presentation to creditors revealed the numbers. Sri Lanka's overall bilateral debt stood at 13.8 billion US dollars as at the end of June this year. 52% of this amount had been obtained from China, which is 7.3 billion US dollars. As at the end of June this year, Japan is the second largest creditor to Sri Lanka. According to a presentation made by the central bank to its creditors recently, 34% of the country's bilateral debt comes from the Paris Club and the remaining 66% are from the non-Paris Club members. In addition, as at the end of June this year, Sri Lanka has accessed 19.2 billion US dollars from international sovereign bonds. These are considered as commercial debt with high interest rates and when it reached maturity, the entire sum must be settled. What is Sri Lanka's way forward until it receives the first tranche from the International Monetary Fund? Central Bank Chief Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe elaborated at a recent creditors conference. Going forward, uh, until we uh, are able to get the approval from the IMF board, uh, probably somewhere in December, uh, we have been, uh, in fact, at the beginning of the year, we had some uh, short-term uh, bridging financing support, mainly came from India. Uh, in terms of uh, short-term credit lines, uh, some of the soft facilities, and also deferment of some of the liabilities for this year clear. But at the same time, we uh, imposed several restrictions on imports and adjusted the uh, the exchange rate, allow the currency to be more flexible, and also tighten monetary policy and economies contracting. As a result, demand for imports is basically shrinking, and also exports continue to perform with remittances also improving some of the measures that we have taken. As a result, we have been able to manage recent relief in the last couple of months without any additional billion financing with limited supply of basic needs for the people in this country. So what we expect even going forward, we have adjusted our policies, we have contracted the economy and contracted the imports and managed exports and also hopefully some tourism will be recurring and also some uh, the repurposing some of the 
financing available from the world bank and adp we think we can manage the situation until we get the approval from the international monetary fund uh, board approval some in december until then we will have some kind of limited supply but we should be able to manage the situation uh, basically uh, in a way that probably would would, would improve uh, the basic needs compared to the situation we had about two months ago Today marks the 63rd death anniversary of former Prime Minister SWRT Bandaranaike who founded the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. The event to pay tribute to the former Prime Minister at the Horagolla Bandaranaike statue was led by Prime Minister Dinesh Gunawardena, former President Chandrika Bandaranaike Kumaratunga, her family members, former Speaker of the House Karu Jayasurya and several state ministers were also present at the event. मैडम पड़ा खता कर लांगो मैडम निजा पार्टी को खुद में व्यक्ति लज्जा निदान है खाती तो वाला लज्जा नहीं पर वेरे कर ले बिल्ला हम दाम लज्जा नहीं बिल्ला हाँ Another memorial for the former Prime Minister was organised at the BMICH under the auspices of Chairman of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party and former President Maithri Parasiri Sena as well. The Galigamwa Balamandala meeting of the Samagi Janamala Vegya was held on Sunday under the auspices of opposition leader Sajit Premadasa. Addressing the meeting, the opposition leader said that the government has designated restricted zones out of fear of the people. On one hand, they are trying to suppress the free media. On the other hand, our youth is being put in jail using the Prevention of Terrorism Act. And they are also declaring high security zones, similar to the times of war. This government treats the people of this country as terrorists. As soon as the high security zones were declared, it was the Rajapaksa henchmen who spoke up and said there is no issue at all. They further said that they were done for the national security. This was not done for national security but for the Rajapaksa security. I would like to clearly say one thing. The Rajapaksa family will have to leave the political arena forever when the people of this country come forward. That time is very close. A culinary competition organized by the Sri Lanka Girl Guides Association for Differently Abled Children was held in Colombo today. Seven teams, each with six participants, took part in the event, which included students from Methmihira Special Education Centre, the Ceylon School for the Deaf and Blind Ratmalana, and many other educational institutes for differently abled children. The competition included preparing a three-course meal, which included a main course and a beverage and a dessert. So our main intention is uh, to um, g uh, make our different able girls able actually to say in other words for them to work as normal citizens of our country. Sri Lanka's culinary excellence is so diverse ranging from extra spicy to extra sweet and today bringing all this together were a talented group of differently abled culinary experts who created their own unique dishes that will take the taste buds of many who are here on a unique and different experience. Rochelle to Modera, News First. Colombo. In times of need, in times of sorrow, both today and tomorrow, with the people, Gamada, empowering the nation. News first with the people. Canadian High Commissioner David McKinnon called on Public Security Minister Tiran Alas in Colombo. The High Commissioner has noted that it is Canada's wish to see Sri Lanka overcome the current crisis and regain stability. The fourth edition of the Divisavia program seeking to support the most impoverished communities in Sri Lanka continued centering the Matale district today. Today marked day 22 of the forced phase. The program is supported by LOLC Holdings. 
The program commenced from the Dambulla Divisional Secretariat. Essential relief packages are being delivered to families that need relief in two separate areas of the Dambulla Divisional Secretariat. The program aims to provide nutritious meals to low-income earners in Sri Lanka. The first of its kind basic diving module arranged for the lady officers and women sailors of the Sri Lanka Navy concluded on a successful note in Trincomalee recently. The certificate awarding for three participants who completed the module was held on the patronage of the Commandant of the Naval and Maritime Academy, Commodore Damien Fernando, at the diving school in the Naval Dockyard, Trincomalee, on the 24th of September 2022. The initiative was set in motion for the first time in the history of the Sri Lanka Navy in July this year as per an idea mooted by Commander of the Navy, Vice Admiral Nishanta Ulugetan, allowing an opportunity for Navy women who are willing to engage in diving. Accordingly, two lady officers and one woman sailor who met the physical fitness standards required for basic diving module completed the module conducted for 20 days from the 5th to the 24th of September at the diving school in the naval dockyard. On successful completion of the basic diving module, Lieutenant Gayanka Satarasingha, Sub-Lieutenant Nimasha Jayavikrama and women able seamen GDD Sakuntala mark their names in the history of diving in the Sri Lanka Navy as the women who achieved this significant feat for the first time. Commenced in 1962, the diving unit of the Sri Lanka Navy established its diving school at the naval dockyard Trincomalee in 1988 to provide formal diving training to Navy divers. Actress Jacqueline Fernandez was granted interim bail in connection with a 2 billion Indian rupee extortion case linked to alleged conman Sukesh Chandrasekhar. The Indian Enforcement Directorate had filed a supplementary charge sheet before the Prevention of Money Laundering Act Court, naming her as an accused. The actor was summoned twice for questioning by Delhi police for her alleged role in the case. She has been accused of accepting gifts worth millions from Sukesh at a time when he was in Tihar jail and was being investigated for money laundering. Last week, Fernandez's stylist Lipakshi Alavadi was questioned by the Economic Offences Wing of the Delhi police for nearly eight hours in connection with the case. During questioning, Lipakshi Alavadi admitted that she knew about the relationship shared by Jacqueline Fernandez and Sukesh Chandrasekhar. Investigations had revealed that Chandrasekhar had, on his birthday, offered a motorcycle to Fernandez's agent, Prashant, and he had declined to take it. Chandrasekhar, who is currently in jail, is accused of cheating many people, including high-profile individuals such as former Fortis healthcare promoter Shivandar Mohan Singh's wife, Aditi Singh. Actress Louise Fletcher, who won an Academy Award for her role in the 1975 film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, died at age 88. Without giving a cause for her death, Fletcher's agent David Shaw told the news agency that Fletcher died in her sleep, surrounded by family at her home in France. According to her son, she died on Friday of natural causes. She had survived two bouts with breast cancer. The actress won the Academy Award for Best Leading Actress in 1976 for her portrayal of ruthlessness Mildred Ratchet in Milo's Foreman's adaptation of Ken Casey's 1962 novel of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. The movie also won awards for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Leading Actor and Best Screenplay. In her acceptance speech that night, she used American Sign Language to thank her deaf parents and thanked audiences for hating her. Her portrayal of the character in the film was so memorable, streaming platform Netflix made a series called Ratchet, which tells the origin story of the nurse-turned-villain. Born Estelle Louise Fletcher on 22nd July 1934, she was the second of four children. And that's a wrap of Primetime News for tonight. Take care, stay safe and good night.